Ecclesiastes 4.9. It says this. It says, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. We could stop right there. That, that, you could go home with the word if we just end it right there. Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Today I want to talk to you about how we are better together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, Lord, this time this morning that we're here, God. Lord, you've called us by name and you put us here, Lord. Not just in Los Angeles, but you placed every individual inside of Third Wave LA, Lord. Lord, we know it's for a divine plan. It's for a divine purpose. You're not a God of accident or coincidence. But, Lord, you mapped it out, Lord. You're divine in all your plans. Lord, you're all-knowing. And, Father, you placed every person here for a specific reason. Lord, help us to see this morning, Lord, that the design that you have for our lives is better when it's fulfilled in community with one another. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This morning, I was driving over and I was thinking about when I was a young lad in elementary school. Do you remember elementary school? I was thinking about a game that we used to play, and and, and I don't know why we used to play it, because now that I think about it, it was dangerous. (laughs) Arms could have been broken. People could have been demolished. We used to play a game called Red Rover. You ever play Red Rover? I don't know why people play that. That's dangerous. You stay, if you don't know what Red Rover is, you stand next to each other and you lock arms, a whole line, and then another, it feels like an army, another army stands on the other side and they hold hands and they call one person over to come and try to break that line and break that chain. And you got to just hold on for dear life and hope that you could just flip them the other way. I remember I was in elementary school and we had a science project and our teacher was teaching us about molecules and how they interact and all this stuff. Bottom line, she said, we're going outside and playing Red Rover. And they, she said, we're going to go play this other class. And I remember the first thing that came to everybody's mind was that this other class, they had a, 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 a young child. We're only in fifth grade, but he was built like a grown man. I, I, honest, I remember, I remember him so clearly. His name was Devin. Devin was 6'3". I, I'm not lying. This is, this is true. He was about 280 pounds. And he had like, he was like, it was mystical almost. Like he had rumors about him. Like I heard from someone else that he was a black belt. And I heard from someone else that this story, he was a legend. And I remember when we lined up or when we were getting ready, I said, man, I don't know about how we're going to do this with Devin. And so I line up next next to two little girls and we were holding hands. And and I'm like, maybe he's absent. Maybe he's not going to be here this day. And there he comes in all his glory coming out of the other classroom. And I remember he lined up on the other side. And of course, the first thing that happens is Devin comes over. You know how you used to do Red Rover, Red Rover, send. I don't know how we picked Dylan first, Devin. We said, Devin! I feel like we're calling Goliath, Devin! And he comes running, and I'm holding this girl's hand next to me. I'm like, just don't let go. Her hand's all small. She's only a fifth grader. She's all little. We're all little. And we're holding each other's hands, and I remember he comes storming, boom, boom, boom. And to my surprise, this little girl clotheslined him, and he didn't make it through the line. I'm pretty sure I had something to do with it. We're holding hands together. And the angle that he came at, he couldn't break through the line. I think our hands were a little too too high because as soon as he hit our hands, he fell this way. And I said, how is it that us holding each other together 
could prevent somebody so big from breaking through our line. Individually, he would have ran us all over. But when we're holding hands together, there's something about the strength that's combined between all of us. You know, in, in Victory Outreach International, we believe in three core values, three C's that God has given us. One of them being cause, the cause that we have, the corporation, and then also community. And community is such an essential part of who we are as Victory Outreach. The church is a community. We are a family. And that's why when you walk into the church, you hear people say, hey, brother. When you first come, that might sound a little weird to you. Sometimes you get used to it. We've been in church for years. You, you don't even think about that anymore. But people in the world just don't go to the store and say, hey, sister in the Lord. Hey, brother. That's the language that we have as the family of God because we're a family. You have brothers and sisters that are here today. And it's important that in the church, in our, in our midst, that there's a sense of family and community. You know that God desires community? How do we know that God desires community? Because God in himself is a holy community. In the Genesis account, God says, let us make man in our image. Have you ever wondered who our is? Like, who is our? Who is back there making people? Who's, who's us and our? That word is plural. <laughs> our speaks of more than one. And it was a reference in our first insight into the triune God. Three and yet one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A holy community within himself. You see, we see the Trinity active on the scene in Matthew 3 in the New Testament when Jesus is in his earthly ministry. It says, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is dearly, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. In that portion of scripture, when Jesus is in his earthly ministry, as he's baptized, you see in one moment, all three uh, parts of the Trinity active in one, one scene, Jesus, the son being baptized, the dove, the Holy Spirit ascending on Jesus. And then the father saying, I'm so proud of my son. Three and yet one, God in himself is a community. And throughout scripture, God makes a case for unity and relationships, and community. In Genesis, when he created man, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. Do we have any married couples in the house? You can testify that it feels good not to be alone, right? Okay, I'm going to give the married couples one more chance. You're sitting next to your wife, and you didn't even get excited. Any married couple is glad that you're not alone. <laughs> there you go. Ecclesiastes, so the portion of scripture that we read, it tells us that a three-strand cord is not easily broken. It says if you're back-to-back, -back, you can really fight. It says if you're, if you're by yourself, how could you keep warm? There's so many things that you can't do by yourself. The Bible says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. God commands his spirit where there is community. You see, the early church was built by a group of believers who understood they were stronger together. They understood that they couldn't build what God was calling them to build all by themselves. They understood that they couldn't build the church being Michael Jordan's. You know, Michael Jordan in his first years playing basketball, he won many, many scoring titles, but no championships. A scoring title is an individual accolade. It's an award that says you individually are the very best at this. And so Jordan started his career being the very best all by himself, but realized there was no glory or satisfaction with winning all by yourself. He writes a book. He talked about his memoirs of how he had to switch his mind to say it's not about my personal greatness, 
but it's about how great I can make the people around me. And if I can make them great, then we can all be great because I'd be rather be on a championship team than to be an individual with awards and accolades, but no championship. See, at Third Wave LA, we're not worried about individual accolades. We're, we're not just trying to live our personal best life. It's not just about all, us having it all together and our family being well and us just caring on Sunday morning if we get what we need. But it's important that we are concerned about the condition of our brothers and our sisters. It's important that we don't achieve personal greatness while the welfare of everyone else around us suffers. I don't know about you, but I want to win championships. I don't want to win MVPs. I don't want to win individual accolades. I want to win championships. And on a championship team, it doesn't matter if you sat on the bench or you played every minute. Everybody gets a championship ring. You just got to play your role. Hebrew 10.25 tells us not to forsake the assembling together. See, there's a danger in isolation. The enemy wants... Church to be a place where you come, but in reality, you do life alone. See, you might be thinking, man, I come to church every Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I feel like I'm all by myself. You see, that's not how God designed church and community and relationships to work. See, Third Wave LA, the church that God has placed here, is not just somewhere to come and feel good on Sunday and then do it all over again the next week. It's a place where you come and you develop relationships with others and other people begin to help us in our journey with Christ. They begin to help us in our personal lives. They begin to help us in our marriage. They begin to help us with our family. See, Third Wave LA is a place where we're knit together. We're not just here coming and then we all leave and it's individual lives and then we come together on Sunday and then we all go back into our individual lives. No, we should all be knit together as one. That's, that's why I want to challenge you. I, told you. I wanted to be practical this morning. I want to challenge you this morning before you leave to get somebody's number that you haven't talked to at Third Wave LA. You say, man, I come every week and I see that person over there, but I, I don't even know who they are. I want to challenge you this morning. Look, look around. Go ahead. Look around the room. Look around the room. This is your family. Okay? Take a minute. If you need to stand a little bit, look to the back. Go ahead. Look around. We got some new lights so you can see everybody. <laughs> look around. This is your family. This is the people that God has called you to do life with. These are the people that are going to help guide you towards your overall purpose and destiny. These are the people that when you're cold are going to warm you up. These are the people that when you're in battle and you're all by yourself, they're going to come back to back with you and start fighting with you. These are the people that are going to have your back when times get tough. It's important that we emphasize the community that God has called us to be. I believe scripture points us to the fact that we're better together. Community is built by strong relationships. And this morning, I want to take a look at the strong relationship we see in Scripture between David and Jonathan. I believe in David and Jonathan's relationship, we can see some true marks of friendship. We can see what it is to be a, a, a genuine friend to one another and continue to grow in everything that God has for us. We see the beginning of David and Jonathan's friendship in 1 Samuel 18, right after Goliath. Immediately, the Bible states that the souls of Jonathan and David were knit together. Let me ask you, are, are you a single thread or are you being knit together with other family? Are, are you just here doing life by yourself or do you say, no, 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 I'm connecting myself. I'm knitting myself together with others. David and Jonathan, check this out. David and Jonathan were very similar people. They were brave. They were warriors. In 1 Samuel 14, we see Jonathan and his armor bearer. Have you read that before? Jonathan and his armor bearer, they go into the Philistine camp. And they go and they, they sneak out and they go over there and they just war. Just them, just Jonathan and his armor bearer. They go over there and they put in some work. It's amazing what Jonathan says when he gets there. He says, his armor bearer is right there and they're having a conversation and Jonathan tells tells his armor bearer, he said, God can win a battle whether he has many warriors or few. 
So let me give you some truth. It doesn't matter how many people God has. As long as me and you are here, we could do it. The Bible says that they went over there and the Philistine army was there and they showed up on the scene and they put in some work. See, Jonathan was a brave warrior. Jonathan was a, a, a man of bravery and courage and so was David. They were near the same age. And they, were, they both trusted in God with all their heart. Even though they were extremely similar, they were also extremely different. Jonathan was the firstborn son of a king, and David was the lastborn son of a farmer. Jonathan was, was, was in succession to the throne of Israel. David's dad forgot he even existed. Jonathan was raised in glory. He was raised in the palace. See, his father came from nothing. Saul came from nothing. But by the time Jonathan was raised, Jonathan was living the good life. Jonathan was living in the palace. David was living in the shepherd field. Jonathan probably had attendants serving to his every need. David had sheep he had to make sure didn't die. And their fathers, both of them were crazy. But one just forgot about his son. He didn't even bring him out when Samuel came. David had been forgotten. Jonathan had big expectations from his family as the crown prince of Israel and next in line to the throne. Through their differences, their genuine relationship with God allowed them to be knit together. You know, it doesn't matter if you're different than somebody else. You're not just called, none of us are called to just have relationships with people that we're familiar with. Sometimes our human nature is just to be friends with people who are like us. You come to church and you say, oh, that person's like me, I got to connect with them more. That's good, there's nothing wrong with that. But we're also called to be in fellowship with people who are extremely different than us. Let me ask you, are you befriending someone who might be outside of your comfort zone for the sake of godly community? Are you saying, I'm going to put myself in a position and I, I might be a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to approach this person and I, I'm going to say, hi, how are you doing? How's your family? How can I pray for you? Are there any prayer needs in your life? I know we might be different. I know we might not. There's, you know, there's some people that meet together in church who would never see each other out on the streets. <laughs> there's some people, there's some businessmen that come and they work in high rise offices. And then there's some people that come and, and you, you would never catch these people together. They, they might come from the streets. And they say, man, I'm, I'm sitting next to this guy from over here. And this guy does this. And this guy does this. And this girl does this. And this. But when we come together, we're one family. And it doesn't matter our differences. God has called us to be knit together as one. And I believe that to break out of having just normal relationships, we have to be intentional with it. We see three characteristics of true friendship through the friendship of Jonathan and David. In 1 Samuel 18, 3 through 4, it says, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. See, number one, true friendship wants to see each other win. True friendship wants to see each other win. This is a heavy relationship that's taking place in Scripture. Because like we talked about, Jonathan is the crown uh, prince of Israel. He should be next in line to be king. But something crazy happens. He sees God's hand on David. But that's his role. That's his place. But he sees God doing something in David's life. Jonathan recognized that David was going to be the next king of Israel. And even though it was Jonathan's rightful throne, instead of becoming envious, jealous, bitter... He celebrated David. He celebrated David. He even said, David, here's my armor. It was a heavy symbolization of David. I know the throne belongs to me, but in reality, God has given it to you. 
and I will lay down my pride when I see my hand on my brother. I will lay down my pride when I see my hand on my sister because it doesn't matter about MVPs and accolades and individual success. The only thing that matters is that the kingdom of God advances forward. That's the only thing that matters. So David, take my armor, take my loyalty, take my friendship, take anything you need to move the kingdom of God forward. Take whatever you need from me, David, because we're on the same team. We're on the same. We just want to see each other win. We just want to see Christ lifted up all over the world. That's our mission and today in the new, uh, uh, under the blood of Jesus. We want to see the world taken for Jesus. And we all have the same mission. We all have the same goal. But it's a danger. Imagine if Jonathan grew envious. Imagine if he grew bitter. Imagine if he said, no, 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 David, that's my place. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you celebrated someone? When's the last time you celebrated someone? When's the last time you, you, you identified someone and said, I, I, I just want to celebrate for what God's doing in their life? I, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to begin to target you. <laughs> He's going to start putting things inside of your heart. You're going to see somebody that had an accomplishment, and you're going to say, I, I have a godly urge to celebrate that person. You're going to see a couple celebrating their anniversary, and you're going to say, you know what? That, that, that couple right there, they've been married for years. They've been, they've been uh, having a godly marriage. I want to bless their life. And, and before you know it, the Holy Spirit's going to start dropping things in people's heart, and this person reaches out to this person, and this person reaches out to... And before you know it, the family of God is thriving. It's healthy. There's relationships being formed because we're being intentional. We're being intentional. The problem is sometimes we see other people succeeding and we talk about them. We envy them. We criticize. We become jealous and we grow bitter. It's human nature. It's human nature to see another person instead of celebrating. Sometimes our instinct is to point out what's wrong. You know, this is especially true in families. Within the family unit, it's easy. If you have a brother, you have a sister, or, or, or whatever family that you have, it's important that we learn how to celebrate. If you've been criticizing, I want to challenge you this morning to turn it into celebration. You, you, you've been criticizing. And here's the thing. You, you can sit here this morning and say, no, 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 that's not me. No, you know. Because maybe you never vocalized it, maybe you never put it on Facebook, but you know where you did post it? Right here. <laughs> you posted it on the timeline of your heart. You posted it right in here, and none of your friends sees it. But you know who has access to the timeline of your heart? You know who indwells you, who has access to everything in your heart? The Spirit of God knows what's really going on. And if you have become critical, I want to challenge you to turn it into celebration. You know who's great at this? Sister Nisi. Anyone know Sister Nisi? I, 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 was, thinking, I was thinking about her this morning as I, as I was driving over to church and I was thinking about the word. Because everywhere you go, Nisi's celebrating somebody. You know when people come into our church, Nisi connects with them right away. She said, man, I, I, people come in, and I've only seen them once, and Nisi's already their best friend. Like, how did this happen? How do you already know their mom, their dad, their sister? You already know how to pray for them. You've already shown them around you. It was, it's a gift that, I don't know if she's here in, in the crowd this morning, but it's a gift that she has. It's a gift that she has. I, I see that, and, you know, it's important that you, you can learn from anybody. When I see her, it's modeling to me, and I, I start to think to myself, who am I doing that with? And I want you to ask yourself, who are you doing that with? Who are you celebrating? Who are you welcoming into the family of God? Because it's not just about being warm, but it's, it's about being warm because when people go through trials, and the enemy's trying to take them out, and the enemy's trying to rob them of their joy, when people don't have anyone else to look to, 
Many times the enemy can find them in a place of vulnerability, a place where there's no one around them, a place where there's no one to speak into their life. I thank God for people who have spoken into my life. I thank God. You know who I thank God for? I thank God for people who remind me who I am. That's important that in the family of God that we remind each other who we are. There's been times in my life, I don't know if this has been you, there's been times in my life where I forget who I am. Where I'm questioning my identity. I'm questioning the call of God. I'm questioning my identity in Christ. I'm questioning things in my life. And I thank God for brothers, for sisters who will call me and say, no, 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 no. That's not who you really are. Are you getting something out of this this morning? My goal this morning is that when you leave this place, you'd be convicted and inspired to call somebody this week. To take somebody out to lunch. To take somebody out to dinner. To say, man, and it's not somebody you usually do it with either. Not your normal Monday night crew. Somebody else. We talked about how you can grow jealous and bitter. Well, what are the dangers of growing bitter? Well, number one, it can hinder your worship. Matthew 23 through 24 says, therefore, if you bring a gift to the altar and there is and, and there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, look at somebody say first. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. He did, the Bible didn't even say just come and lay your gift and then later on go and reconcile with your brother. It says leave your gift right there. And go find your brother and reconcile with them. If you have anything in your heart against anybody else, the Bible makes it clear that before we come and worship the Lord, we must be clear of any turmoil, any tension, any conflict that exists between any believers. You may be coming to the altar every week, sobbing, crying, tears everywhere. But God is saying, hey, I need you to make amends. I know you come to the altar every week and worship. That's great. But I need you to do something else. I need you to make amends with your brother and your sister. In 1 John 4.20 it says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. That's the cold stone word of God right there. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, check this out, whom they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. So the Bible is saying, how can you love God and you can't even grasp him or feel him, but you can hug your brother and you can see your brother and you know that they're there. And if you can't love what you can see, how can you love what you can't? See, many times it's easy for us to love God. Oh, I love you, Lord. And I lift my hands. We worship the Lord. We praise him. And then we go right back into our bubble where we're hating on people. We go right back into a place where we have envy in our heart. We go right back to a place where we have strife with a family member. We go right back to a place of turmoil in our marriage. It's important that not only do we worship with our with our acts of worship and our song and our praise, but that we clear our hearts of anything that would hinder our worship. We, 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 we clear our hearts of any strife, bitterness, envy. 1 John 2, 9 says, If anyone claims to be in light but hates his brother, he is still in darkness. John 13, 35 says, By this all men know that you are my, my disciples, if you love one another. It doesn't say if you, if you friend somebody on Instagram, then they'll know you're my disciples. It doesn't say if you, if you, if you just have them in your contacts that, that you're one of my disciples. If you love them. If you love them. And what is love? Love is demonstrated. Let me ask you another question. When's the last time we demonstrated love to somebody? I know we say we love each other. But I believe it's important that we demonstrate our love. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. He demonstrated his love by dying on the cross. See, a lot of people can be vocal about their love, but few can demonstrate it. And when we 
take our brother and we take our sister and we develop relationships and we want to see each other win. We're showing that we love one another. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul tells us that bitterness and strife reveals our maturity. That's a whole other Bible study. But Paul was telling Corinth, I, I, I got to give you milk and I can't give you meat because of the state of your maturity. There's strife, there's envy, there's, there's so many things among you that I want to give you more. You know, there could be things that God wants to give us, but we're hindering him with our maturity in our relationships. You've been praying, God, I want more. And he's saying, I want you to mature in your relationships. You're saying, God, give me a new level in my life. And he's saying, I need you to get past these little things. Work on the milk and we'll get to the meat. I want to be a church this year that celebrates each other. I, I want to be a church that celebrates each other. Let's look for reasons to celebrate each other. Let's look for anything we can to celebrate one another. We got Fernando that's on his way to Amsterdam, Holland. That is something to celebrate. That's something that our church can get excited about. Not only get excited about it, after we're going to pick up an offering for him. <laughs> So everyone who cheered, we're going to need you to give. <laughs> That's a great accomplishment for our church. There's people here who are graduating universities and doing so many things, and we want to celebrate you in the church. The second thing about friendship that we see about David and Jonathan is true friendship is loyal. See, in 1 Samuel, Saul ends up growing jealous and envious of David. David becomes very successful. People love him. He's going through the streets after he kills Goliath and after he's had military success. He's going through the streets and the people are saying, Saul kills his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul got bitter. Because Saul had become carnal and he didn't celebrate him like the others. But he grew a hatred for David and wanted him dead. Isn't that interesting that a carnal heart will grow envious and bitter and critical of what other people celebrate. A heart that has become carnal, what other people celebrate, you'll be sitting there and you have these feelings inside of you you don't know how to deal with. Man, I, I feel critical. I feel judgmental. Many times it's a mark of our carnality. Many times we're going carnal and things bother us. Saul had grown carnal and so he tried to kill David. He threw spears at him. He even tried to get Jonathan to assassinate David, but Jonathan refused. You see, through all this, Jonathan stayed by David's side, revealing to us that true friendship is loyal through it all. I said true friendship is loyal through it all. Look at this. Look at this. Jonathan was by David's side when he was the next big thing in Israel. He had just defeated Goliath. He was the big thing in town. He, he was at the height. He, he, was, he was victorious. He was successful. And so Jonathan was attached to him and he was with him. But I'm sure there's other people who connected themselves to David when he just defeated Goliath. That wasn't the real test of loyalty. The real test of loyalty is when Jonathan was near David, when David was on the run for his life. When David didn't know if he was going to live or die, when David was running around city to city like a madman, he didn't have the throne of Israel. He was running around not knowing what was going on in his life. And even in that moment, in the lowest of lows, Jonathan was by his side because true friendship will be with you in the highs and it'll be with you in the lows. I don't want people next to me that only are with me when I defeat Goliath. I want people who will ride or die with me. Even when I'm going through some low seasons, I'm going through some tough battles, I'm going through some things that I can't even tell everybody about. I need friends that will stick close. What am, I, what am I telling you this morning? It's important that we stay close to people, not just in their highs, but we stay close to people in their lows. Staying close to people when they're going through things. Staying close to people when they need a shoulder to cry on. Staying close to people when, when they're looking for direction and they're looking for guidance. Staying close to people when they make mistakes. Hello. All of us make mistakes. 
It's important that we stay close to someone in the midst of their darkest battles. Godly friendship will be there through it all. Friendship that has an angle or, or, or it, has a, it has personal interest in it will only be there in the good times. But true friendship will be there through it all. Galatians 6, 2-3 says, share each other's burdens. Share each other's burdens. Our burdens are not just ours alone to bear. Here at Third Wave LA, we want to help you bear the burden. We want to help you with everything that you're striving for in your life. We want to be there for you. We want to be the community that rallies around you. It's to share each other's burdens, and this is the way to obey the law of Christ. And then it says this, if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. That wasn't me. That was the word of God. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Jesus examined constantly his disciples' ability to withstand the good times and the bad times. It's important that us, as a church, that we lift each other up. I was reading an a, a, a article, and I'm going to be coming to a close. I was reading an article, and it was talking about how the army of God many times is the only army in the world that kills its own wounded. It says one of the only armies that has a tendency to kill its own wounded. What does that mean? Sometimes when our brothers are at their lowest, when our sisters are at their lowest, it's easy for us to not give them any, any mind, any attention. It's easy for us to even say, well, they did that to themselves. It's easy for us to say, well, that's, they're, they're just a product of their decisions. Oh, they're going to learn their lesson. I've thought like that before. I've thought like that. I've seen someone in a situation thought, oh, that's their fault. That's their problem. That's on them. But that's not godly relationships. That's not godly friendship. That's not godly community. Godly community is being there for someone through the highs, the lows, the hills, the valleys. You know, in this life, we're celebrating our one-year anniversary, but we're going to be doing this for a long time. One day we're going to be here, we're going to be celebrating five-year anniversary, and then we're going to be celebrating 10-year anniversary, and then 15-year anniversary, and then 20-year anniversary. And, 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 and trust me, we're not going to be celebrating it in the club. We're going to be celebrating in a building, hello, with thousands of people. It's going to be a 10-year anniversary. And we're going to say, we used to talk about this day when we had thousands and thousands when we were at Catch One Nightclub. We're going to talk about these days. We're going to say, man, you remember the Friendship Auditorium? You remember the Friendship Auditorium? We're going to say, man, you remember Catch One when we show up early and make sure it didn't smell like bottles and all this stuff? You remember when we would show up and there'd be liquor bottles on the ground and we'd have to clean? We're going to talk about these days when we're, where we see the fulfillment of everything that God is showing us. We're speaking mega. We're going to see it. We're speaking big. We're going to see it. We're going to see thousands and thousands come. But how are, how are you going to get there? How are you going to make sure you're there when we're celebrating five years? See, what does it mean if we're celebrating 10 years, but we lose people on the way? We want you to stay connected. We want to be knit together. The way we're all going to get there together is by being the community that God has called us to be. Being the family that God has called us to be. I want to challenge you this morning. Call someone this week and just check how they're doing. I, I didn't want to bring a deep word. This I wanted to be practical. That's why we're having a men's fellowship coming up. You got to get to the men's fellowship so that we can be knit together as one. Let's all stand here this morning.
with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe you're here and you say, man, I have strife in my heart. I need to be healed of bitterness that's inside of me. Maybe it's to a family member, a loved one, a friend, someone in the church. You say, man, I need to be healed. Maybe it's a father, a mother, a sister, a brother. Whatever it is, you say, I need to be healed. Or maybe you're here today and you say, man, that's everything you're talking about, about doing life alone, that's what I've been doing. I've been doing life all by myself. I've been not letting people into my circle, into my life. But I don't want to do life alone anymore. I want people who will come beside me. I want, I, I want to come beside others. If that's you here this morning, I want you to just lift up your hands. Hey, this is Pastor Ryan, and we want to thank you for joining us here today. We believe that this message has not only spoken to you, but also challenged you. And there are three things that we want you to do here today. The first thing is like this video. Secondly, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thirdly, share this video with someone you know that needs to be transformed. Listen, this is Third Wave LA, where hope is found and your purpose is lived out.